Hey everyone, Wags here from Eagle Dynamics. In this DCS AH64D video, we'll explore the engine, flight, and fuel MPD pages. Perhaps not as exciting as weapons and sensors, these pages can be critical for operations of the helicopter, and a good understanding of the functionality is important. Let's get started. Before we dive into these pages, let's first talk about how to manipulate them. Around each of the four multi-purpose displays or MPDs are bezel buttons. There are 24 variable action bezel buttons around each of the MPDs. With the top, left to right, you label T1 to T6, right, top to bottom, being R1 to R6, bottom, left to right, being B1 to B6, with B1 being labeled M, and left, from top to bottom, being L1 to L6. I'll be using these bezel button designations in this and later videos. There are also fixed action bezel buttons near the bottom and have single functions. These include FCR, weapons, TSD, aircraft, communications, and video. There are also controls for brightness, video brightness, and day-night mono display options. When on a page, you can most often interact with the page using these bezel buttons. You can also interact with your MPD using the MPD cursor controller. This is slewed with your cursor controller switch on the collective, and the cursor display select button can instantly toggle the cursor between the two MPDs of the pilot. To move the cursor between the two MPDs, you can also slew the cursor to the side nearest the other display and slew again in that direction to move it over. When the cursor is over a cursor selectable action, indicated by the bezel option being bolded, you can press the cursor controller enter button to action the selection. The cursor controller enter button is available as a depress on the slew switch, on the underside of the collective, and on the right hand grip. Pressing the fixed action M bezel button at B1 displays the menu page and we can select the engine at B2, flight at B3, and fuel at B4. Let's now talk about the engine page. The most visible aspect of the page are the vertical bars that indicate torque, temperature, and rotor and power turbine speeds. Leftmost are the torque values for the number one or left engine and number two or right engine. As collective is added, the bars will grow and the digital indications will indicate the percentage of torque. There's also a red bar that dynamically changes position based on rotor speed to indicate max torque limit, as well as yellow bars that will appear under single engine conditions to indicate single engine torque limitation subranges. When the bar passes one of these levels, the bar color changes to match torque values can range from 1 to 130 percent. You can think of torque values as the amount of lift and thrust that the main rotors are generating before you overstress the powertrain system. During dual engine flight, the continuous torque range is 0 to 100 percent torque with a 6 second transient of 101 to 115 percent torque. Exceeding 101 to 115% torque for 6 seconds, or 115% of torque for any length of time, will result in possible aircraft damage and an exceedance being written to the fault exceedance page. To the right is the turbine gas temperature, or TGT, of number 1, or left engine, and number 2, right engine. These behave the same as the torque bars, with visual bars, a digital value, and limitation subranges displayed based on conditions. This can range from 0 to 999 Celsius. While the bars are helpful, two numbers should be committed to memory, 867 degrees Celsius and 896 degrees Celsius. These numbers correspond to the engine's dual engine and single engine TGT limiters. Exceeding these TGT values result in loss of main rotor speed, or droop, which can greatly affect lift. These TGT values correspond to the aircraft's maximum torque available, which can be found on the engine preference page. We'll discuss this later. Right of that is the power turbine RPM, or NP, of the number one or left engine, 
and ranges from 0 to 120%. Power output from the engines into the powertrain is managed by the engine's Digital Electronic Control Unit, or DECUs, which automatically regulates the NP values to keep the rotor speed at 101%. This can be adjusted using the engine power levers on the left console. In normal flight conditions, you'll simply keep them in the fly position and leave them there. To the right of this is the main rotor RPM, or NR, and ranges from 0 to 130%. This indicates how fast the main rotor blades are spinning. Regardless of how fast the main rotor blades are spinning though, no lift can be generated until collective is applied which causes an increase to the aircraft's torque indication. As previously mentioned, the engine's DECUs will automatically keep this value at 101%. Reducing torque below 12% with both engines operating will result in an increase in main rotor speed. If 106% NR is exceeded, a voice warning rotor RPM high will be enunciated. Generally increasing collective will assist maintaining main rotor RPM during low torque settings. Finally, to the right of the NR tape is the number two or right engine, engine power turbine RPM. On the right side of the engine page are the digital NP RPM values and the engine gas generator RPM values known as NG in percentage scales for engines one and two. At B2, we have the engine system page. When selected by either pressing the bezel buttons or cursor selecting it, we have five windows and the ability to turn off the generators one and two from L5 and L6. The engine window is in the top left and displays the engine oil pressure values for engines one and two, as well as the nose gearbox for NGB one and two oil pressure and temperatures. In the upper right corner is the hydraulic window, which displays the PSI values for the primary and utility hydraulic systems and the utility hydraulic accumulator. It is important to point out that the utility hydraulic accumulator provides 30 to 41 seconds of emergency hydraulic pressure in the event of a dual hydraulic failure. In the middle of the page is the transmission oil window and displays the transmission oil pressure and temperatures for the number one and two sides of the transmission. Below the transmission oil window is the ECS temperature window and displays the temperature of both crew stations and the extended forward avionics bays, or EFABs. The stab position window indicates the stabilator position and the nominal airspeed based on the stab's position. It's important to note that exceeding this value will result in loss of pitch control of the aircraft. Because there is a flight page selection on our currently selected page, we'll use that instead of returning to the main menu flight page by selecting T2. Much of this will look familiar to the HDU cruise mode. Along the top is the heading scale, the lubber line, the command or bob up heading, and the alternate pilot or CPG sensor bearing. Directly below is the bank angle indicator or triangle. To the right is the barometric altitude and to the left is the torque value. If the engine temperature is in a caution or warning state, its temperature is listed below. Centered on the flight page is the attitude indicator, the water line, and indications like the navigation to our home plate symbol, the flight vector, and others. Along the right side is the radar altitude and the vertical velocity scale. On the left side is the airspeed, and below that at L5 is the bezel button to toggle the waterline bias of negative five degrees or remove the manual bias entered in the flight set page. We'll discuss the bias function further in a moment. Below is the waypoint status window with a selected waypoint, distance to it, ground speed, and time to reach the waypoint. Centered in the bottom is the turn rate indicator with 
each vertical element indicating one half standard rate turn and a full standard rate turn in the box centered over the left or right triangle, more commonly known as the doghouse. Below is the trimble. We'll now dig deeper into the set subpage by selecting B6. While much of the page stays the same, there are several changes. At the top of the page, at T1, the high bezel button allows you to set the desired radar altitude at which the high indication on the right side of the page will trigger when exceeded and the radar altimeter is on. Click on the bezel button, enter the altitude in feet on the KU, and press the enter button. To the right at T3, the low option operates the same will trigger a low indication when altitude is below the set value. This also triggers an audio message from Betty warning altitude low. This audio warning will go off at the set altitude when less than 10 feet AGL, 10% below the set altitude when between 11 feet and 999 feet AGL, and 100 feet when it's set between 1,000 and 1,428 feet. For this reason, the low altitude bug is typically sent to 55 feet during training, so it'll go off to 50 feet, thus reminding students to align the nose of the helicopter with the landing direction, rather than maintaining the aircraft aerodynamic trim. In combat, this should be set as low as the crew is comfortable with to avoid an immediate engagement with the ground. At T4, we can set the air pressure value in either inches or millibars. And to the right of T5, you can manually edit the barometric altitude using the KU. At T6, you can use the KU to edit the barometric pressure. The window below shows the barometric altitude and barometric pressure. Editing either of these will automatically update the other as appropriate. A practical example this would be, if you don't know the altimeter setting at your location, but you know the airfield elevation, you could enter the elevation into the barometric altitude window and it'll automatically adjust the barometric altimeter setting. Below the altitude and vertical velocity scale at R6, the radar altimeter can be toggled on and off, and along the bottom at B2, the unit of distance can be toggled between kilometers and nautical miles. The arrows at L5 and L6 allow you to manually set the bias of the waterline against the attitude indicator. As airspeed is a function of the aircraft attitude, this can be adjusted to match an airspeed to a level pitch attitude along the flight page artificial horizon. If adjusted from the default, a bias indication will appear. Along the left side is the G status and accelerometer. The center of the scale indicates 1G, and the solid triangle indicates the current G. Each tick mark indicates 1G. The hollow triangles indicate the maximum position and negative G attained since the G was reset at L2. The red circles indicate the maximum position and negative G limitations based on the current weight, airspeed, and environmental conditions. Last, let's look at the fuel page by going back to the main menu and selecting B4. In this example, I have four external fuel tanks loaded. This is not something you'd normally do. In the center of the page is a graphic representation of the aircraft with a forward fuel tank in the front with its current amount, internal Robby tank in the center with its amount, and the aft fuel tank at the bottom with its amount. The external fuel tanks are indicated as ellipses on the wing, but they do not show their remaining fuel because they do not have fuel probes. The left and right auxiliary bezel buttons at R1 and L1 toggle fuel transfer from the external tanks to the internal tanks. If more than one fuel tank is loaded on a wing, only the lines from the inborn tanks will be drawn to the internal tanks as fuel is automatically transferred from the outboard tanks to the inboard tanks. The center auxiliary tank can be enabled or disabled with the bezel button at L2. Unlike the external fuel tanks, the remaining fuel quantity is depicted. It will feed both the forward and aft fuel tanks. Remember to enable the center Robby fuel tank during the first fuel check. If forgotten, the aircraft will remind you when you have approximately 1,100 pounds of fuel remaining by presenting forward fuel low and aft fuel low master cautions. 
fuel boost pump can be enabled or disabled from the R2 visit button. This pump is commanded on automatically by the aircraft systems during each engine start sequence. However, it may need to be manually enabled by the crew during cold climate conditions. Crossfeed is automatically set to aft when the fuel boost pump is engaged because the fuel boost pump is mounted on the aft fuel cell. The three crossfeed bezel buttons at R3 to R5 allow you to select which fuel cells supply which engines. With Ford selected, the Ford fuel cell will supply both engines. With aft selected, the aft fuel cell will supply both engines. And with norm selected, the forward fuel cell will supply the left engine and the aft fuel cell will supply the right engine. The crossfeed valve can be used in an emergency to transfer fuel between the fuel cells to keep balanced. This should only be used if the fuel transfer system has failed. At L4 is the fuel transfer bezel button and this allows fuel to be balanced between the forward and aft fuel cells. Setting to forward moves fuel from the aft to the forward fuel cell. Off inhibits fuel transfer between the cells. Aft transfers fuel from the front to the aft fuel cell. And auto automatically levels fuel between the cells throughout the flight. Along the bottom of the page are three windows. The rightmost window indicates the flight endurance time in hours and minutes for just internal fuel and total fuel, which also includes the Robbie tank and the external tanks. To the left are the fuel flow rates for engines one and two and the total fuel flow rates in pounds per hour. The leftmost window shows the amount of internal fuel and total fuel, which also includes the Robbie tank and external tanks in pounds. The external fuel tanks do not have any fuel monitoring equipment, so you'll need to manually enter their fuel quantity with the auxiliary gallons external bezel button at L5. Upon pressing it, enter the total fuel quantity of the external fuel tanks into the KU and press enter. This will then allow the total fuel and total endurance windows to be accurate. It is worth noting that each gallon of JP8 fuel weighs 6.7 pounds, so that should be taken into consideration when doing fuel calculations. Fortunately, the KU has a built-in calculator function that provides an in-cockpit solution. Last, at B6, we have the fuel check option. Pressing check at B6 results in a start bezel button at R5 and the fuel check window appearing in the top left corner. Above the start bezel button are options at R2 to R4 to determine how long to run the fuel test. Press and start then runs the test for the selected time with a run timer, start time, and fuel burn rate in the check window. Once complete, an advisory will appear on the EUFD to alert the crew that the fuel check is complete. Burnout or fuel exhaustion, visual flight rules fuel reserves, and instrument flight rules fuel reserves are displayed in the upper right window. The fuel check can be terminated by pressing the stop bezel button at R5. Thank you for watching this video and I'll see you next time. Thanks.